Well, the politics channel has uh, tens of thousands less subscribers than the tech channel, so I imagine no one's watching this. But you can always watch it later. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about why Arthemisia is wrong about Section 230. I have pulled up over here, and you'll see me looking this way a lot. I have the comment chain on his video about the White House wanting to reform Section 230. Uh, what is it called? It is called, oh no, Supreme Court to overturn Section 230. I'm getting something confused with something else. <clears throat> and I have 47 U.S. Code 230. The actual law. I know, it's crazy, right? Imagine somebody talking about a law and having the actual law up. I know, crazy. I, I am a nutty boy. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about uh, my comment on this video. See, the problem is Arthemisia, like a lot of other YouTubers, doesn't understand Section 230. They don't seem to understand what actually is said in Section 230. There is no publisher versus platform distinction. And this, everybody seems to just repeat. Publisher and platform, publisher, platform. Are they a publisher or are they a platform? Well, that's not how it works. The law doesn't have a distinction between a publisher and a platform. This is some myth. I don't know where it came from, but it needs to die. But Arthemisia brought up something a little bit different that I never really considered before. And that is, Arthemisia thinks that the good faith part of the law somehow makes it so that if you censor someone and you do it for naughty reasons, you do it for reasons that someone disagrees with, oh, well then, that's, that's violating the good faith part. You're violating Section 230. <clears throat> Real quick, just going over some stuff that I've already gone over before. Section 230 cannot be violated. There is no part of CDA Section 230 that lays out an offense for which you can be punished. The thing is, you have to remember what Section 230 really is. It is a portion of a much larger bill called the Communications Decency Act. The CDA was struck down. Hang on. <coughs> Dry throat. The CDA was struck down, largely. Section 230 was one of the big survivors of the CDA. The purpose of the CDA was to enable censorship. In fact, the CDA's whole point was to prevent patently offensive material from being distributed to minors. Uh, and you were supposed to... Basically, they wanted to regulate the internet. They wanted to make it so that anything that was too offensive was also locked away or not distributed at all or, you know... Website owners need to just not distribute these things that are patently offensive. Now, what's patently offensive? Well, back then it meant one thing, but these days, I don't know if you've noticed over the past decade, but a bunch of rainbow-haired freak lunatics have decided that anything that disagrees with what they want is offensive, and therefore <laughs> would theoretically fall under the purview of the Communications Decency Act. It's a problem with decency. Your decency and my decency are not necessarily the same. I have different morals and ethics than you do. So, this mismatch is a little bit of a problem, especially with the First Amendment being really friggin' important in the United States. First Amendment, if you take someone's right to speak away before they speak, if you have a law that says this kind of speech isn't allowed, that's called a prior restraint on free speech, and with very, very minimal exceptions requiring very high bars to clear, a prior restraint on free speech by the government is illegal. It is not allowed. So, get back to the whole CDA thing over here. The CDA basically constituted a prior restraint on free speech. You can't just be like, oh, if you say something offensive, then that, that could lead to liability. Civil and criminal liability, in fact. So, now that you understand that the CDA overall basically made it illegal to spread stuff that's too offensive to, you know, people that don't want to see it, it was a censorship law. We can go over this good faith theory that Arthemisia has. I am going, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, and I really kind of don't care. Um, and I, will, I just want to be clear here. 
I generally like Arthemisia's content. I watch some of it on a fairly regular basis. This is a point on which they need education, and I'm here to educate. I'm not here to directly poop on their head. I just want this person to understand what's really going on here. So, not shitting on other YouTubers. Keep that in mind. All right, my comment. There is no publisher versus platform distinction in CDA Section 230. There is no requirement to handle people in good faith, because there's not. There is no text in 230 that spells out a violation of 230 other than possibly having parental control tools available and not telling the user about them. Read the text of the law. I have a video on JBP explaining this. Blah, blah, blah. Arthemisia just replied, I covered this section on my channel. Yes, there is. You are, one, you are wrong about this 100%. I said, quote the relevant text from the law. Now, this is all within two hours. So... He didn't respond. I said, since you won't quote the law, I'll do it for you. 47 U.S.C. 230, C, sections C, 1, 2, A. That, it's literally C, 1, 2, A. They're subsections. It's a lot of subsectioning, isn't it? <clears throat> C, 1, 2, A is the only time, quote, good faith is used in the law. Let's read it and understand the context. I have the law up here, too, but I'm just going to read what I wrote. <clears throat> no provider or user of an interactive computer service, an interactive computer service being like a web forum, somewhere basically where people can post user-generated content. It's interactive as in you can interact with it. Shall be held liable on account of any action, and I'm cutting out some of the parts that are irrelevant, but any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd. Obscene is a specific thing, by the way. It doesn't just mean offensive. Um, it's also violation of the First Amendment, but that's more a philosophical argument than a legal one. Uh, obscene, lewd, so, you know, uh, sexually exciting. Lascivious, sexually exciting. Filthy, uh, disgusting, really, really disgusting, like eating poop. Uh, excessively violent, so some violence is okay, but if it's too violent, oh, no. Uh, harassing, I guess that's pretty clear by itself, or otherwise objectionable. That's the key. That's the key a lot of people miss. Otherwise objectionable. Further, it's the operator or the user. And if the, if the operator or user finds it otherwise objectionable, so it's a blanket statement. It's referring to anything that they find objectionable. There is no, there's no room in there for, well, other people think that you finding it objectionable is unreasonable, therefore, you're wrong, you can't do that. That, that doesn't exist. It, it does not matter why they find it objectionable. All they have to do is claim that it's objectionable. Remember, social justice warrior lunatics, woke tards, love for there to be this sort of uh, everything that disagrees with me is violence, harmful, people will be hurt, injured. It's, it's life-threatening in some cases. If you disagree with me, you could cause the end of people's lives. So, yeah, objectionable, otherwise objectionable, plus this loony ideology where social justice freaks are just like, oh, hey, everything that disagrees with me is objectionable. Well, yeah, of course, we now have blanket censorship, and it's totally fine. This is the problem. There is no cap on that. But this law was made to enable censorship. In fact, the law... This part was made to make it so that you're not liable for censorship. The rest of the law was made to make it so you're liable if you don't censor. So keep that in mind. Or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. People miss that part. People don't understand that part. What was happening in the mid-90s was that forums and anywhere that user-generated content could be posted... Um, they were getting sued for deleting forum posts. You run a forum, you delete someone's post, they would sue you for violating their First Amendment rights because there was no precedent for this. You know, they would speak, you would delete their speech for whatever reason on your forum, and 
you'd get sued. You'd get a First Amendment lawsuit. This basically led to an internet where no one was allowed to really run a forum because if you run a forum, there's an extremely good chance you'll be dragged into an extremely expensive, time-consuming lawsuit that'll ruin your life. So that that's why that's there. It says if someone basically if someone deletes the stuff that you post to their website, um, that's not a First Amendment violation. Uh, so get over it. <clears throat> so um, my comment continues. The operative phrase is any action taken voluntarily in good faith. Good faith is hard. It's easy to understand what good faith is as just a general principle. It's fair dealings. It's <clears throat> if I approach you, let's say you run a Burger King and I approach you to purchase a burger and you are there to sell burgers um, I'm approaching you in good faith because what I want to do, I genuinely want to purchase a burger from you and eat it. Now, let's say I came there claiming to want to purchase a burger from you, but my real purpose was to put a cockroach in it, take a picture with my phone, post it up to Instagram, and blackmail the company. Or even just shame the company. Okay, that's bad faith. That's the opposite of good faith. Bad faith is when you come to something unfairly, you do something that is shady, you do something basically wrong. Good faith requires fair dealings. That's the whole concept of it. But the problem is good faith doesn't mean much without further context. What's good faith? And you can't know that without defining bad faith. The problem is if you look up Section 230, bad faith, you don't find jack. In fact, nobody really clarifies what good faith means in this whole Section 230 thing. So, the operative phrase, any action voluntarily taken in good faith, right? That requires us to define good faith. What is good faith in the context of the CDA? And I, I talk about it. The section, um, the CDA opened up civil and criminal liabilities for people who didn't censor, basically. So what happens is the CDA makes you liable for not censoring. Then, Section 230 makes you no longer liable if you make a good faith effort to censor offensive content. Arthemisia is reading this as if the good faith part means, well, you can't delete my stuff if you're doing so, like, for political reasons rather than because you find it offensive. Well, I mean, something can be offensive for, for political reasons. But the problem is that the good faith part doesn't act on the censorship. You're not... Cens the censoring in good faith bit, it has nothing to do with the person who has posted and been censored. It has to do with relieving the civil liability of a person who's trying to censor. So it has nothing to do with that person's post directly. The person who was censored doesn't gain some kind of like right here. They don't there's no actionable thing here. It's saying if you if there's patently offensive content, that's the whole point of the CDA. If there's patently offensive content or even just offensive content and we require that you try to not distribute it. And this part's saying, well, if you try and you know, even if it still gets distributed, if you try to not distribute it. If you try to censor, you in good faith, you actually made an effort rather than just like a token, eh, I deleted one and I just couldn't be fucked to deal with the rest. If you made a good faith effort to censor, you are immune for to any civil liability that the larger Communications Decency Act invokes. But most of the CDA got struck down, so those liabilities really don't even exist anymore. So, what you have is some language in the CDA here, in Section 230, that is sort of a legacy holdover from when the entire law was passed. Once the law was largely struck down, a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, matter whether you make a good faith or bad faith or whatever faith effort to censor. The liabilities that the CDA created are gone. So, this section kind of doesn't do much. It, it definitely doesn't relieve a problem. I mean, there's nothing there to relieve. It's gone. It's struck down. But what he thinks is that people have some kind of... Uh, that something, somehow, some the law is being violated if you're censored by someone for the wrong reasons. 
doesn't say that anywhere in the law. And the good faith workaround isn't going to change that. And that's all there is to it, man. By the way, hi, um, Cyrillic person in the live chat. I'm glad to see that someone's watching. So that's it. That's, that's really it. Um, and I finished it off saying you're interpreting it to mean the object addressed by the good faith statement is the censorship itself. It is not. The object is the civil, li civil liability for putting patently offensive material on the internet. To quote your own words, you are wrong about this 100%. That's it. Arthemisia's wrong. The good faith part of the CDA section 230 is not the magic bullet that you think it is to get all this censorship garbage we're dealing with gone. Tread carefully when it comes to section 230 reform. You can literally change the face of the entire internet quite easily for the worse if you reform this law. Tread very carefully. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Please subscribe. I'll be posting more politics videos in the future, and you won't want to miss any of them. Have a wonderful day. Stream over. Love y'all. Take care. Stream over.